Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to get a series of videos on Julia Savola's classic text on the Hermetic tradition. This will be the first of four lectures covering the preface as well as the first 10 chapters of part one to be followed very soon by three other videos going through the rest of the book. This is a response to a patron's request all the way back in July of this year um, to uh, seriously study here over YouTube a text which he himself had described as being noticeably denser and noticeably more difficult and less accessible than Evola's more widely read works like, say, Revolt Against the Modern World. There is, however, a very serious connection between this lengthy treatise on alchemy and his critique of the sort of political phenomena which are perhaps more immediately or more obviously recognizable as being worthy of our attention, such as in that work, the critique of democracy and of things like that. Um, there's really a serious connection, though, between the perhaps you know, pragmatic critique of current events as they're unfolding even in our, in our own time, we can apply this sort of Evolian critique to them, um, and the perhaps theoretical foundation for that critique, which is dealt with, I think, at a much greater level of detail in this particular work on something which seems as unrelated to current events as alchemy. And that is a connection which might perhaps surprise you, but is still well worth investigating publicly now here over YouTube, at least while we are able to do so. Now, I remind you that this is a part of the School for Ben Texts, and you can join us there for as little as just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description. I'd like to also begin with the disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes alone. The purpose of this video is neither to promote nor to refute any theories, but rather to consider them from a strictly philosophical perspective. Alright, so if we get into the text itself, we'll notice that Evola opens the preface by noting that this book deals with the Hermetic tradition, but specifically in the medieval and Renaissance sense of that term, rather than saying the ancient uh, Greco-Egyptian cult of Hermes sense of the term. For this reason, what he's really trying to emphasize is that the present text will be directly concerned with alchemy. But wait a minute, what is alchemy anyway? Before proceeding any further, we must first refute the myth that alchemy was nothing except a primitive and pre-scientific attempt to do the same thing which, of course, modern chemistry later perfected. Above all, this viewpoint confuses two fundamentally unrelated hermeneutical methodologies for one another. For, whereas modern science is built on a type of literalism which is actually suffocating, the texts of alchemy repeatedly stress the symbolic, allegorical, and secret nature of the discipline. This could not be otherwise, for the ultimate reference of such discourse are said to be invisible and of a higher plane than that of mere physical matter. For example, the texts note that only those who can read between the lines will see that, for example, sulfur represents the will and smoke represents the soul as separated from the body. However, the deeper point is not simply to archive this plurality of symbols into some ever larger, ever growing set of such symbols, which is basically the methodology of materialistic natural science, but rather to see how all of the symbols say the same thing by disclosing a type of universality and primordiality which reveals the plurality of naive givens in which you're always immersed as a, a phenomenal observer stuck within the natural attitude, basically, to reveal that plurality of objects to be itself a grand, unfounded illusion. Is this all, then, just mysticism by some other name? Or is it, in fact, a real science in which supernormal powers, even including the transmutation of metallic substances, actually can be achieved? It is no coincidence that alchemy concerns itself not with the passive discovery of gold, which is itself the royal solar symbol of tradition, as we'll get back to in much greater detail later within this lecture, um, but rather with actively making gold, for alchemy must be recognized as a royal art of the heroic rather than an impersonal modern science for which the character of the human subject actually must become so irrelevant as to actively require an anonymous placeholder which we have found in recent times is actually just better filled by machines that can collect all of that data and process it much better than we can. 
This allows us, though, to also understand why alchemy required a certain intentional obfuscation in order to protect its true meaning from the uninitiated, for after the fall of Rome, the particular kind of sacerdotal dominance embodied within the Roman church forced the heroic and royal art into hiding. One had to use euphemisms of transforming lead into gold in order to pass off the illusion that physical rather than spiritual matters were under discussion, and therefore to avoid any worry of charges of heresy coming involved in the work. Quite humorously, this turned out to be so effective a methodology that even St. Thomas Aquinas himself ended up authoring an alchemical treatise, or at least having one attributed to him, despite being the official philosopher of the Catholic Church. The present work is divided into two parts, the first dealing with symbols, and that is of course what we will cover the first half of in this lecture, while the second will deal with practice. Evola promises the reader in this preface that this book will indeed allow one to go on to study and decipher any alchemical text within the corpus, however obscure and intimidating it might be. Right, so if we move on to part one, the symbols and teachings, the introduction titled The Tree and Serpent and the Titans notes that um, even within the Christian tradition, we can easily recognize the tree as a spiritual symbol expressing the idea of some universal force that spreads out in much the same way that the energy of a plant spreads out to its branches, leaves, and fruit, but from a common source. Interestingly, this symbol of the tree is associated with both the positive value of the quest for immortality and the negative value of the destructive force of the serpent or dragon, as can be seen even in the Old Testament narrative of the Garden of Eden, containing, however, perhaps subtly, both of those hermeneutical motifs. The symbol of the tree, however, is indeed universal rather than unique to any one civilization, and interestingly takes on an inverted form in the Vedas, in which the origin of the power is actually up there above in the heavens rather than down below in the earth, as would be the case for like a literal naturalistic tree growing from the ground up. In the Persian tradition, we find the double tree, which echoes both the first and the second tree of the Garden of Eden, as most people forget that Adam and Eve were banished in order to prevent them from eating the fruit of the second tree. It was not just the crime of having eaten the fruit from the first one. But above all, the tree must be appreciated as a feminine symbol, and that of the Divine Mother, as we will get to in much greater detail uh, later on in this present lecture. As could be expected, the symbol of the tree plays a major role in the alchemical texts too, for the tree's double meaning is preserved within that tradition as both the source of the water of life that revives the dead, and paradoxically as the dragon which embodies the dissolving power of a negativity explicitly associated with death. This conflict is more apparent than real, however, for it only makes sense that the hero who embarks on the quest for immortality will be put to the test of withstanding the overwhelming force of negativity before hoping to reach that goal. Likewise, the story of Adam, which most people are familiar with, is only one of several possible realizations of this same symbol. Although for Adam, the tree simply is the negative symbol of a temptation leading to his own downfall, there are other myths where the hero actually does succeed in uh, gaining immortality, even for his entire race, quote unquote, rather than just for himself. For example, most people will recall that the Buddha himself gained enlightenment underneath a tree. For this reason, if Ulla contrasts the figure of the saint of, say, uh, medieval Catholic religion um, with the magical hero, the problem with the former is that it tends to portray the quest in purely negative terms, not because one tried but failed, but rather because the quest itself was wrong and should never have been attempted in the first place. This interpretation of the tree, however, misses the point that the power of negativity overwhelms the would-be hero only because it was so great a power 
as to have justified taking that risk in the first place. It is only natural, then, that the sacerdotal, as opposed to royal interpretation of alchemy, is that of a literal Luciferian Prometheism, which was only ever accidentally leaked to the human race by some malicious fallen angels. As even the Book of Genesis records, these same fallen angels had impregnated earthly women who gave birth to the Titans, who are, however, only allegorically described as giants but whose supernatural power actually was more spiritual than simply physical. A fitting obfuscation, by the way, carried over to the same alchemical tradition as a whole. Evola then goes on to argue that just as Adam is banished from the garden before he can reach the second tree, and Prometheus is chained to the rock before he can do any more damage than he already had by giving the humans fire, it is a mistake to see these as the end of the story. As Evola said himself, the flame is not extinguished, rather it is transmitted and purified in the secret tradition of the royal art, which in the hermetic texts is explicitly identified with magic, extending even to the construction of a second wood of life as a substitute for the lost one. This is, then, an emphasis on necessity that will seem alien to those uninitiated into this way of thinking, as one text warns that, quote-unquote, the occult energies of the astral entities, insofar as they do intervene, do not obey one's prayers, but instead act solely by virtue of a natural chain of necessity. Just as Tarl Warwick, better known as the infamous vlogger Six, Hexenhammer666, informally defined magic in his 2016 book uh, Occult Mimetics, Reality Manipulation, as cause and effect by means which are not culturally acceptable, especially within whatever scientific community is dominant in a given era and place, Evola also emphasizes a remarkably simple determinism between cause and effect, quote unquote, as the chief hermeneutical tool used to grasp what really goes on within the field of, say, alchemy. What is the goal of all of this, though? Well, man is a peculiar being with a double nature, capable of embracing both the divine and the terrestrial at once. Alchemy restores power to the race of humans without, however, forcing them to leave that terrestrial plane. And that I just want to tell you, will be something we will return to many times over the course of this text, a very important idea. In chapter 1, The Plurality and Duality of Civilizations, Evola opens this chapter by referencing Oswald Spengler's idea that history is not contrary to what they might have told you in school, the single unified story of how progress has been unfolding in a teleological orientation to the modern world and us ever since humans got here. For such an idea as that would negate Oswald Spengler's discovery that there are, in fact, a plurality of different civilizational forms, each of which embodies a unique set of hermeneutical prejudices so deeply ingrained within that worldview as to make mutual comprehension from one civilization to another virtually impossible. The myth of a single continuous trajectory of progress also falls apart, by the way, when one realizes that a given civilization is bound by a finite life cycle, in which the particular types of accomplishments or systems of knowledge or truths made possible by that civilization's unique hermeneutical conditions of interpretation and expression come to be gradually actualized over time, until eventually all of the conceptual real estate which is available comes to be exhausted. After that point is reached, any new forms that emerge within that civilization are either redundant of what had already been done before or simply devolve into noise. What better example of this, by the way, than Western music? For contrary to expectation, pretty much everything that could be done with Faustian music was already figured out all the way back in the 18th century by people like Mozart. After that point, you have either neoclassical music, which reiterates what was already done centuries ago, or you have the kind of avant-garde trash currently fashionable among pseudo-intellectuals in the academic industry who pretend that they hear great art where everybody else pretty much just hears a bunch of dreadful noise. Spengler noted that eventually the civilization that suffers this fate declines and then vanishes. 
This is the end of a cycle, a shape at odds with any interpretation of a never-ending arrow of progress. While Evola praises Spengler's discovery of a plurality of civilizations, he warns the reader that this is, in itself, not the full story. In addition, one must consider the duality, or specifically the duality of the two worlds, that of being and becoming. The deeper problem with the myth of progress is not that it negates the plurality of civilizations, but instead that it negates one of these two worlds entirely. That is, it posits um, the realm of material becoming in flux as the only one of these which really exists, therefore negating entirely the higher realm of a spiritual being in which you do have a universality and stability of enduring forms. It is no coincidence, then, that the myth of progress emerges at exactly the same time that the philosophy of materialism does. This is the real reason, by the way, why the modern world is totally incapable of understanding the Hermetic tradition. Interestingly, Evola all but explicitly warns that staying immersed in only one of these will result in a purified linguistification in which, to quote him himself, one will succeed only in filling his head with words rather than the deeper spiritual essences which these words were supposed to be a means to an end to allow one to grasp. This only makes sense when one realizes that the man of tradition literally had a different way of perceiving and knowing, to quote Evola himself, the antithesis, one might say, of which is, of course, the sort of empty linguistification which people take for granted now as the only form of knowledge they could hope to obtain. Only the viewpoint open to both of these worlds, that is to say, the uh, realm of mere becoming and the realm of higher being, as we will get to in greater detail in this lecture, will allow certain symbols to be empowered to awaken our interior perception. On a practical level, only such a hermeneutical standpoint, which incorporates both of these worlds, could allow the rites performed to actually confer magical and operant power, which would be totally inaccessible to the pseudo-horizon of linguistification alone. In chapter two, Living Nature, um, Evola quite interestingly goes as far as to designate the human experience of nature as the fundamental issue in the study of the Hermetic tradition. The reason for this emphasis on nature is that what modern man takes for granted as the norm with regard to the experiencing of nature is actually fundamentally incompatible with and unrelated to the hermeneutical standpoint towards nature, which was dominant in the world of tradition. Above all, the modern standpoint towards nature attempts to distill its essence into a set of mathematically formalized laws fixated on raw forces like heat, light, and electricity explicitly as devoid of any uh, spiritual value. In the world of tradition, however, nature was not the detached object of intellectual contemplation, but was instead a living sacred body experienced through living mysteries into which one was initiated in a properly magical sense of that term. Myth, then, was not the modern idea of a creatively fabricated work of art for art's sake, but was instead something which arose as a necessary factor of a certain dramatization of the imagery of this spiritual process of experiencing nature rather than simply thinking about it. In Chapter 3, The Hermetic Knowledge, Evola notes that with these criteria established, it really does make sense to call alchemy a natural science, despite the fact that one means exactly the opposite of what one might think one means in saying so. Though few people realize it today, our idea of natural science really comes down to us um, as a half-remembered remnant of a medieval idea of natural philosophy, which was itself understood at that time to be a synthesis of two unrelated elements, these being materialistic science on the one hand and intellectually unrealistic philosophy on the other. This artificial synthesis of unrelated elements, however, 
is a later aberration fundamentally at odds with the traditional relation to nature which accepted the organic unity of the cosmos as a presupposition to allow one to rise up to a higher metaphysical plane but within nature itself once again a very important idea the later phenomenon of naturalistic materialism only ever emerged through the negative failure to hermeneutically access these deeper forces of nature as one's psychic sensitivity to them progressively dwindled just as progress in the modern sense of the term supposedly um, gained ground. On the other hand, even references to asceticism within the Hermetic tradition must not be misinterpreted as empty pseudo-mystical withdrawals away from the natural world as the opposite of the kind of materialism we take for granted um, is uh, misinterpreted as a type of religious sentimentalism defined by so many privately held beliefs and privately experienced feelings which one openly admits one could never hope to prove the validity of to anyone else. Instead, Evola explicitly notes that hermetic asceticism is actually simply a technique. Just as many first-time readers of Jacques Ellul are surprised to find that he designated magic within the technological society as basically the earliest or oldest technique known to man, rather than the direct antithesis of technique, Evola is also very careful to emphasize that alchemy is a technique in that it is meant to provide an experience that is not limited to the dead or common elements, despite the fact that it has nothing to do with technology in the modern sense of that term. In chapter 4, One the All, Evola goes on to note that reorienting one's perspective on nature as a unity, rather than a plurality of so many isolated objects and as a living spiritual force rather than a dead construct of mathematical formalization will allow one to appreciate the hermetic phrase one the all or in greek entopan this principle of unity is not an abstract and unprovable philosophical hypothesis about how reality might be constituted but is instead an actual state at which one can arrive through the very precise means of overcoming the opposition between the I and the not I, which is otherwise taken for granted as an irreducible presupposition of phenomenal experience. It is the practice of ritual rather than abstract speculation which brings this about. The alchemical symbol of the circle stands for one the all because the circle is that line whose end contains its beginning, an idea also captured by the symbol of a snake eating its own tail. The all has also been symbolized as the undifferentiated chaos from which everything emerges and as the egg which expresses a similar idea in a more explicitly living form. The circle of Ouroboros is not then the static circle of an unchanging object, but is rather that which somehow is both itself and its own overcoming at the same time. Symbolically, the snake's poison is that negativity which dissolves the established order and introduces change, even into its own self. This coincidence of a masculine symbol of that which dominates and a feminine symbol of that which is dominated in the single recursive image of a snake eating its own tail makes the one androgynous but in the very precise sense that the one somehow is both its father and its own mother at the same time. This radically self-sufficient one is also symbolized by the stone which contains all four elements and rules over them through a paradoxical relation also symbolized as the divine water which escapes any naive attempt at definition because it is both attracted to and yet always fleeing from its own elements. For we are not dealing with a static given here, but rather with the power of destruction considered as such. In chapter 5, The Hermetic Presence, Evola goes on to inform the reader on the hermetic teaching of imminence, the greatest surprise of all being that this living chaos we just described is not something extrinsic to man, but rather something which lies within him too, for all possibilities reside within us. One classic text reads that though few notice it, everyone has it in his power. 
Unconventional as such an idea might seem to be at first glance, one might recall that somebody very significant once said the kingdom of heaven is within you, as even the Bible itself contains this same idea. This power, which fills everything equally but is rarely noticed by anyone, is symbolized within the Hermetic tradition as a water which man thirsts for despite the fact that he already has it. The well-known formula, that which is above is as that which is below, therefore indicates a certain mystery of corporeality in which the body is not an obstacle standing in the way of this power, but is instead the individuating principle through which it comes to be instantiated, much like alchemy's general emphasis on nature, which escapes both materialism and religious sentimentalism. Evola goes as far as to claim that certain metallic states are conceived as ossifications of forces that reveal their secret in corresponding states of the spirit that lie sleeping in the heart of corporeality." End quote. One goal of alchemy, then, is precisely to arrive at such an intersection of this knowledge of the cosmos and one's knowledge of the self, at which point any opposition between these two will give way to a unity which had, in a certain sense, already really been there all along. In Chapter 6, Creation and Myth, Evola notes that uh, just as there is a relation of correspondence between the elements of the cosmos and the elements within man, so too is there a relation of correspondence between the process of cosmic creation and the process of, say, personal creation within man, broadly termed art. There is a certain ambiguity, though, in such references to creation, which might lead one to think of it as something which happened a very long time ago and then was completely finished soon after it began. After all, this is how most people interpret the account of six days of creation recorded within the book of Genesis. Well, useful as the metaphor of six days might be, an overly literalistic interpretation of it will miss the point that, as a metaphysical process, creation lies beyond the limits of space and time altogether. This is why even some Christian mystics have correctly realized that one must speak of an eternal creation. Likewise, the biblical account of creation is indeed true in quite the same way that the labors of Hercules or Jason are also true. That is to say, as hermeneutically meaningful symbols alluding to extratemporal spiritual states and acts. One must be careful, however, not to overemphasize the symbolic nature of this, for the point of alchemy is to arrive at a real perception of this state of creation, both within nature and also within man himself. In chapter 7, Woman, Water, Mercury, and Poison. Evola returns to the one, the all, mentioned earlier, but now chooses to emphasize that in this phrase, the all refers to a certain chaos of undifferentiated possibility, typically symbolized by the dark night. Not coincidentally, Hegel also used the symbol of the dark night to capture the power of a certain divine negativity as it exists before being disclosed within history through any particular religious gestalt, as you will see the last few sections of Phenomenology of Spirit deal with this issue. This night, though, is not, on not the only symbol to capture such an idea, as Evola reminds us that the feminine symbols of the mother, or the goddess of sublime beauty, etc., are also quite important and frequently used within the Hermetic tradition. Above all, though, it is the symbols of water and mercury that will come to be the most significant, and this is because mercury is that metallic water out of which all things are made. Another very important symbol is the dragon, whose fire is able, is able to conquer all. How then can one make sense of this ambiguity in which the symbol we are dealing with stands for both death and life, except to explicitly acknowledge this as a double meaning. It is no coincidence that a symbol of death is also that which the king gains greater life from after he bathes in it, as you see with Siegfried gaining um, greater physical strength after bathing in the blood of the dragon. This venom of the serpent, which dissolves so many seemingly fixed essences, is not, then, to be fearfully avoided. 
for it is instead a matter of coming into contact with it, but in just the right way. An idea no doubt expressed in its own very idiosyncratic way within the philosophy of Hegel. We're not trying to avoid negativity, but rather to deal with negativity in just the right way. What though is that right way except the symbol of Marduk battling the dragon in ancient Assyrian mythology? A battle which is symbolic of the hermetic idea of separation, which will come to make up the theme of the next chapter. Chapter 8, The Separation of Sun and Moon, notes that our earlier emphasis on nature as a unity inevitably leads to certain paradoxes, such as the question of how nature can relate to itself both positively and negatively, in that it both desires itself and also holds the power to say no to itself. Well, whereas we earlier had emphasized the androgynous nature of that which both dominates itself masculinely and is dominated by itself femininely, Evola now shifts his attention to the explicit separation of these two poles, with the one holding the former role and the all holding the latter role. This separation into masculine and feminine allows also for a passage from the symbol of the circle as first matter to the symbol of the circle with an inner dot, which is of course the ancient hieroglyph of the sun, while the feminine pole becomes the moon. Sun and moon then make up the fundamental hermetic duality in that the sun makes up the center which the, moon, the moon's forces must be grounded in or else devolve into so many blind impulses symbolized by a fall through the water hieroglyph, better known as the upside-down triangle pictured on the screen. This fall, then, is not the end of the story, for the battle between solar heroes like Hercules, Jason, etc., and the dragon of unformed matter provides a means to elevate this undigested stuff to a higher order of power through such a struggle. In metallurgic terms, this symbol of the sun is easily recognizable as gold, the substance which cannot be altered by any acid, while the feminine moon is equally easily recognizable as the quicksilver or the fluid silver water of mercury. In addition, the sun is associated with a fire qua a non-material principle of all animation, quote Evola himself, while the moon is associated with a light qua the wisdom which reflects that solar power, as the moon does indeed reflect the sun in nature too. In chapter 9, Frozen and Flowing Waters, Evola notes that once such separation it comes to be established, the doctrine of the two natures can be expressed far more clearly in terms of the relation between solar and lunar. Under this view, becoming is properly designated in the ancient and medieval um, texts as sublunar in the very literal sense of being dominated by the feminine fluid quicksilver of lunar unformed matter, while being is properly described as the immovable form of a solar victory of law, order, organization, and equilibrium over mere change, to quote Evola himself. In metallurgic terms, then gold is being while quicksilver is volatile becoming, or in Aristotelian terms, the sun is form and the power of individuation, while the moon expresses the material and universal. Interestingly, Evola explicitly associates the being of solar form with the power of limitation, in that one cannot succeed in achieving a concrete individuation unless some limit is set against the formless becoming of so much mere matter. This, however, is perhaps the exact opposite of how Thomas Aquinas had understood the relation between form and matter in medieval Catholic philosophy, since Aquinas had argued that different individuals belonging to the same generic species can only be distinguished from one another on the basis of material cause rather than formal. This was for the very specific reason that the essential form, once stripped of all accidental contingencies, is precisely what defines their membership within the same species. So the only thing which can separate, say, one human from another is the ultimate contingency 
of being composed of different raw materials. It was for this very specific reason that Thomas Aquinas was forced by his own methodology to assert the seemingly absurd idea that every angel is its own species, for in the case of such immaterial beings, there is no form matter composition whatsoever to fall back on to explain how one angel can be different from any other. Likewise, Evola himself associates the ego principle with gold, uh, the solar principle being or form, but warns that the body must not be written off quite so quickly as the kind of unindividuated, chaotic, volatile matter which one could legitimately um, attribute such a title to unstable psychic drives, spirits, etc. The purpose of alchemy, one might be reminded, is not to negate the body, but rather to elevate it. And this is because the individuated body is also defined by the kind of limit and measure which escapes any charges of the inferiority of such indeterminate or indefinite stuff. In chapter 10, Salt and the Cross, um, Julius Evola returns to the symbol for the fall into um, lunar becoming earlier um, represented by an upside down triangle and water, but notes that the same symbol can be inverted into its exact opposite of an ascent up to solar being, which can be represented by a normal right side up triangle and also by the symbol of fire. Similarly, the descent into lunar becoming can be expressed by a horizontal line indicating a state of lying flat, while the ascent upwards can be expressed by a vertical line to indicate the stance of standing upright. Taken together, these two make up the all too familiar symbol of the cross, but now one which is properly understood as a synthesis of both masculine and feminine powers. Applied to the circle, the horizontal line represents the stagnation of matter or salt, while the, the body reduced to a sepulcher or prison like the rock which Prometheus was chained to after he dared to steal the fire from the gods.